Today's video is brought to you by HelloTushy.com. Hey brother! Ben, one of the unfortunate things about the Harry Potter movies is that they just didn't have enough time to cover every little detail from the books. Meaning that some fan favorite characters or moments like the entire Quidditch World Cup or Ludo Bagman or Winky or the Maze or wow, these are all from Goblet of Fire. Last ended Scroots! Point is, they're all things that didn't make it into the films. And on the one hand, this makes me just like crave a binge-worthy TV show where they just recovered the main series books in extensive detail. But on the other hand, I do understand the constraints and they did still manage to pack a lot into the movies. And amongst that packing in contains a few rare golden nuggets where the movies actually went off script and added in scenes. Now, not every instance of this was a success. I mean, like, yes, Ginny tying Harry's shoes, but no blast ended scroots. Are you kidding me? I understand one would have taken a lot more CG, but seriously, the sh why the shoes? But amongst the occasional cringe, there are some true gems that actually at times one up the books. And today we're counting down those movie moments. Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, HelloTushy.com. Mother's Day is just around the corner and we've all done those traditional gifts, the sentimental card, the flowers, the macaroni art. So why not shake things up this year and give your mom the gift that just keeps on giving? That is right, I'm talking about the Hello Tushy 3.0. Whoa, 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 whoa. It cleans your butt and itself with its Smart Spray automatic self-cleaning nozzle. I know I'm impressed. And I know what you're thinking. I don't wanna give my mom a project and I agree, you don't, but good news, this is not a project. It snaps onto your existing toilet with no additional plumbing or electricity required. And each Hello Tushy bidet comes with a 60 day risk-free guarantee and a 12 month warranty. And don't worry guys, we've taken the liberty to write a poem you can scribe directly onto the box. Mother, roses are red, ranunculuses are blush. Neither could be as good as your next flush. Love, Philip. This Mother's Day, give the gift of a clean butt. Go to hellotoshi.com slash super to get 10% off your order plus free shipping. This is a special offer just for our viewers. Again, go to hellotoshi.com slash super for 10% off plus free shipping. That is hellotoshi.com slash super for 10% off. Link is in the description down below. We're kicking off with number 10, open up you. Open up you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Can you imagine? Gosh, poor Bonnie Wright. She gets cast to play the coolest character in the whole book and then just, they, uh, they just, uh. no, but number 10, for real, Hermione punches Draco. Honestly, I don't know how much I even need to say about it. Can we just play it like three times in a row really quick? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, but can we do it again, but this time add funny comic book sounds? Now, to be fair, this scene is in the books, but it's a mere slap and not a full on punch. And I think the extra octane really does the trick here. And as much fun as it is to just see Hermione punching Draco, what's extra great about the scene is that it is a physical representation of Draco's beliefs literally blowing up in his face. In Chamber, Malfoy infamously calls Hermione a mudblood and just simply believes that pure blood wizards are superior to everyone else. And yet here he is is a pure blood wizard losing in thoroughly non-magical fashion. Although to be fair, I think Hermione would have totally ousted him in a magical duel as well. One more punch. <laughs> Number nine, Felix Felicis. Okay, so the scene in question here happens in Half-Blood Prince and the book's version of it is fine. Harry drinks the Felix Felicis and he confidently makes all of the right decisions for reasons he doesn't even know when he gets the memory from Slughorn and defeats Voldemort, blah, blah, blah. But if you've been watching all of the movies, you may have noticed at this point, you're probably squinting to see literally anything on screen. Because with each new film, the movies get thematically and literally darker and darker. And at this point, we are at a low saturation Duration evening funeral for a spider. It's dark, which is why this is the perfect juxtaposition to finally let Daniel Radcliffe off the leash and just flex his comedy muscles. Not to mention the pincers. Raise your hand if after watching that, you too also went <laughs> pincers. Number eight. Turn on the lights. This is a quote from Dumbledore that happens at the opening feast in Prisoner of Azkaban, and it's one that is so good you think it had to come from the books. 
but it didn't. And I particularly like it in the movies because not only is it just general good wisdom, but it introduces early on the idea that happiness is the key to overcoming darkness. Focusing in on really happy thoughts is of course what allows a wizard to conjure a Patronus, which makes this scene also really good foreshadowing for Harry's later defeat of the Dementors and what has to be one of the best moments from the entire eight movie series. Expecto! Patronum! I'm sorry, I don't even have to ask, but I know you just got chills. And fittingly, I might add, as we roll over into number seven, I've always wanted to use that spell. I've always wanted to use that spell. Ah, the absolute giddiness in her voice right there. Like, round of applause for Maggie Smith, am I right? Okay, so in the books, McGonagall also does deliver this spell, and it's just as epic, but she does not add that final line. But this one stands out to me so much because it's honestly a combination of the last two items items on this list. We're seeing some out of character comic relief from the always stern Professor McGonagall and it lightens the mood just a little bit. Bear in mind now we are in the eighth movie and it's the preparation for the final battle. So the saturation is like down here. Like everyone's got their flashlight out just trying to see anything on screen. But then she delivers this line and it breaks the mounting tension. It makes you laugh even when the darkness is approaching. And that is exactly the advice Dumbledore just gave about finding the happiness. Of course, in this situation, happiness isn't turning on lights. It's activating an army of medieval statues. But speaking of preparing for the Battle of Hogwarts, that brings us to number six, the flight of Severus Snape. So again, this is happening right before the final battle when the teachers decide that Severus Snape has got to go and McGonagall, Flitwick, and Sprout duel him out of a window. And I love moments like this because it shows that characters who would normally not even hurt a fly can totally duel a dark wizard out of a window. Although Snape would still be flipping in a duel, I'm just saying. The irony, of course, is that the reason they start dueling him is because he says he's looking for Harry, and we now know that the reason he's looking for him is so he can give him the memories now, conveniently. But nobody knows that in the moment, so he is delayed and dies by Snake. But what makes this scene so great in the movie is that there is a blink and you miss it moment that shows that Snape is still a good guy, or well, at least on the good side. Watch closely right here and you'll see that Snape isn't just deflecting these curses, he's redirecting them into the Death Eaters behind him. Snape is somehow managing to hold his cover whilst also doing some good in front of the entire school. And it's just, it's awesome when you see it happening. But speaking of incredible, let's move on to number five, one of Ben's all time favorite moments from all the movies. Nice one, James. There is no doubt that Sirius was James's best friend right down to the final moments, but this scene is just too cool for a couple of reasons. First of all, everyone is constantly telling Harry how he looks just like James all the time. You look just like your father. Except for the eyes, you've got your mother's eyes. Except for in the movies where they're not even green. But in this moment, it goes beyond Harry's physical appearance. Sirius is responding to Harry's skill and personality. To Sirius, in this moment, Harry is just like James. Skill formidable, talented. Nice one, James! And some might argue that this moment represents a tragic flaw in Sirius, that he only ever saw Harry as a replacement for James and not as Harry himself. But I would argue it's just the opposite. Like, yes, he does slip on the name, but it's not because he's in the middle of reliving his glory days. It's because James was the greatest person he ever knew, and here Harry is living up to that standard. So he's not slipping on his best friend's name, he's slipping on the greatest person I ever knew's name. And it really works here because even though Harry never really knew him, that's also how he thinks of his father and who he's trying to be like. James was by no means perfect, but Harry lived up to all of the best parts of him. That brings us to number four, Wands to the Sky. This is a scene where I totally get the change up from books to movie. In the books, Dumbledore's funeral is a really big deal and it would have called for getting a ton of extra characters on set and it would have been just a giant production nightmare. And besides all that, most of the funeral just takes place from Harry's point of view anyway and he's barely even paying attention. Now in the book, there is still a crowd of people around Dumbledore's body and Harry does make his way to the front and find the locket. But the big salute, the raising of the wands, that's added. That doesn't happen in the books. But I like it. I think it's 
it's very emotional and respectful, and it lets us see the characters we actually care about say goodbye to Dumbledore without us having to endure seeing Umbridge show up at his funeral. And on top of that, McGonagall yet again finds a way to find a light in the dark. She is the first one to raise her wand to the sky, and as she does this, the camera pans up to the dark mark, which is still looming overhead. But as the rest of the crowd also raises their wands, the dark mark is filled with light and then dissipates. But speaking of Umbridge, number three. I'm sorry, Professor. I must not tell lies. Oh, <laughs> this one found good. Let's, let's play it again. Let's play it again. Do it again. I must not tell lies. All right, whoever wrote this into the script deserves a medal. For context, Umbridge has been doling out detention to Harry all year, making him write the phrase, I must not tell lies with her blood sucking quill. And every time he writes it, it also etches it onto his hand, and now it is permanently scarred there. Which, by the way, only other villain to permanently scar Harry besides Voldemort, just saying. Anyway, this scene takes place just as the centaurs are about to take umbrage, and she is pleading with Harry to convince them that she means them no harm. Tell them I mean no harm! Harry, being the straight savage that he is, responds simply, I'm sorry, Professor. I must not tell lies. Savage! Even umbrage as she's being carried away by the centaurs had to be like, that was good, that was good. You want to know what wasn't as good, or, well, at least not as happy? Number two, Dobby's death. Okay, so Dobby's death is for sure in the books, and it is heartbreaking no matter how you slice it. But the movies, if you'll pardon the expression, manages to drive the knife in even deeper. Oh, who's savage now, Harry? No, I'm sorry, that wasn't funny. Look, here's the thing. The movies do Dobby a tremendous disservice by introducing him in Chamber of Secrets and then just forgetting he exists for five movies. Gillyweed? No. Winky? No. Spew? Nah. Cut it. We don't need it. Who needs elf rights? Elf, elves do. Elves need elf rights. That's the whole point. At the very least, though, Dobby's final moments get some serious screen time and some additional dialogue. In the books, they arrive on the beach, Harry and Dobby see the wound, and Dobby's final words are just Harry Potter. And in a way, I do love and respect the simplicity here, but in the movie, he also gets this. Such a beautiful place to be with friends. Dobby is happy to be with his friend, Harry Potter. Sorry, hold on. Gosh, is it just me, or does it seem like every scene they added into the movies was to drive home the very specific theme of finding the light in the dark? I mean, here Dobby is dying, and despite this, he is managing to simply notice what a beautiful place this is and how lovely it is to be surrounded by friends. Well said, Dobby. Well said. But that brings us to number one. But first, some honorable mentions. These didn't make our top ten, but I love them anyway. First, I'm the chosen one. Yeah, you are, Harry, and way to own it. My gosh, how refreshing. Number two, Neville and Seamus blowing up the bridge, which is great because one, it gives Neville a big win, and two, is a payoff for all of those different moments Seamus had of something blowing up in his face, which was just a movie thing anyway. That doesn't really happen in the books. And one final honorable mention has to go to... What exactly is the function of a rubber duck? They go in cups, Arthur. They go in cups. Okay, but for real, number one is Harry Breaks the Elder Wand. This is a straight up change from the books to the movie, and I really like it. It's got less to do with how epic it is and more of what it implies. In the books, rather than breaking the wand, Harry decides he's going to return the wand to the tomb and says, I'm putting the Elder Wand back where it came. It can stay there. If I die a natural death like Ignotus, its power will be broken, won't it? The previous master will never have been defeated. That'll be the end of it. Which is a great sentiment, but uh, no, Harry, that is not how it works. Or did you forget that like an hour ago, you just revealed that you became the master of the Elder Wand by physically taking a whole separate wand from Draco? And look, I know we harp on this constantly on this channel, but that's for good reason. It's because it's a total can of worms. And nobody likes canned worms. Maybe fish. But like, excuse me, Harry, aren't you headed towards a career as an Auror? Like, do you know what that entails? Like, Harry, I know you're good and all, but being a dark wizard catcher and never once 
being defeated like you think pretty highly of yourself right now, don't you? I'm the chosen one. You are the chosen one for Voldemort, Harry, not everyone. All it takes is one bad day, Harry. One sleepless night, one mistimed sneeze, and boom, some rando was the master of the Elder Wand. And like, heck, as fickle as this wand is, all it might take is even someone cutting you in line at Starbucks. I can just imagine the wand sitting there in Dumbledore's tomb, sensing it happen, being like, what? Did you see that? Potter is done. I like that guy. He needs his latte right now. Getting aside though, the point is it's not exactly the safest decision Harry could have made. And he just revealed to like half the wizarding world how the Elder Wand works and that it's real. Like I know everyone's on the same side, today, but someone is gonna go looking for that thing. But breaking it is such a nice move by movie Harry because it represents the exact sentiment book Harry is going for, but it's less arrogant about his future endeavors and just settles the matter right then and there. It's the only wand that can repair other wands and if it's broken, you know what that means? It's broken. It's meaningful, it fixes a fairly significant plot point and is a great way to end the series. Well. Now we just gotta watch out for some dude with a metal detector stumbling across the resurrection stone in the forest. But until then, for my question of the day, what is your favorite movie scene that was not in the books or that the movies just did better? Let me know in the towel section down below. Guys, thanks as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you want some more Wizarding World stuff though, you can check out this video right here where we count down the top 10 most evil characters in Harry Potter. Spoilers, Bellatrix doesn't even make the top five. What? But that's all for today. Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.